Jonathan Edwards in 1736 wrote, I am far from pretending to be able to determine how many have lately been the subjects of such mercy. But I hope that more than 300 souls were savingly brought home to Christ in this town in the space of half a year. That's pretty impressive if you consider that before that revival, the congregation in Northampton may have had about 600 people. You add another 300 souls, I would say that's a pretty good awakening. But even as early as March 1744, President Edwards says, The present state of things in New England is, on many accounts, very melancholy. There is a vast alteration within two years. God, he adds, was provoked at the spiritual pride and self-confidence of the people and withdrew from them. And the enemy has come in like a flood in various respects, until the deluge has overwhelmed the whole land. There had been from the beginning a great mixture, especially in some places, of false experiences and false religion, with true, but from this time the mixture became much greater, and many were led into sad delusions. In another letter, dated May 23rd, 1749, he says, As to the state of religion in these parts of the world, it is in general very dark and melancholy. In the preceding October, when writing to Thomas Erskine of Edinburgh, He communicates to him an extract from a letter to himself from Governor Belcher of New Jersey, who says, The accounts which I receive from time to time give me too much reason to fear that Arminianism, Arianism, and even Sassinianism and destruction of the doctrines of grace are daily propagated in the New England colleges. By 1751, Jonathan Edwards had been voted out of his own congregation by about 220 people to 20. So the question we're going to ask in the back of our mind today is, what went wrong? What were the aberrations in the first great awakening? And did Asa Hell Nettleton learn from them? And did he aim to correct them? And was he successful? Now, revivals at the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th centuries. By the way, I just want to give you a little footnote. You see these pictures in these books before there was color photography. A lot of these pictures were done by Samuel Lovett Waldo. That's actually a self-portrait of him. These guys were very, very good. And if it wasn't for men like him, we wouldn't even have this. This is before there was any photography. Now, I just was telling you about the great revival in the first great awakening. Some things went wrong. I've been trying to study this for about 28 years as this material was brought forth in about 100 pages in a book called The Constitutional History of the Presbyterian Church by Charles Hodge. Were there, in fact, a number of spurious revivals? In in the beginning of... uh, Let's say 1792, 1790, up to 1798 was the beginning of what we call the Second Great Awakening. It didn't get as much publicity as the First Great Awakening, but there was quite a revival that had went on. The nation was in a state of declension after the First Great Awakening through the Revolutionary War, and there's a number of reasons for that. I think infidelity was brought in because of working with France in the Revolutionary War, but a lot of men who were teaching theology, like John Witherspoon, a president of Princeton University, got really active in the Revolutionary War, and he became um, on our side and a forefather of our country. But the seminaries, the colleges were really in decline at that time. But then revival broke out, and it was the purpose of the uh, Connecticut Evangelical Magazine, which was commenced in the year 1800, to detail some of the revivals that were going on. This is, uh, I told you about print-on-demand works. I find these magazines online, and they'll print them through the espresso book machine. Like I said, I can print that, have that book printed out for me. It takes five minutes. So things that are really interesting to me historically, 
I've been able to get a copy of. This is another book. This is an actual uh, photo litho print, they called it, that was republished. Most of these books I've narrated. It's an interesting part of our country's history that people don't know about. The revivals that went on from about 1792 to the 1830s. And it was uh, remarkable some of the things that happened. And that's where we learn about Asa Held Nettleton, who was born in the year 1783. But how was he converted? His conversion plays such an important point in what he learned that made him the student of revival and of counseling that he became. On the night of the annual Thanksgiving in the fall of 1800, Asa Hell Nettleton attended a ball. The next morning, while alone and thinking with pleasure on the scenes of the preceding night and of the manner in which he had proposed to spend the day, in company with some of his young companions, the thought suddenly rushed upon his mind, we must all die and go to the judgment. And with what feelings shall we then reflect upon these scenes? This thought was for the moment overwhelming, and it left an impression on his mind which he could not efface. He began to see the plague of his own heart, his doubts respecting the truth of the promise which God has made to those who ask and seek were dispelled by the painful conviction that he had never asked and sought as God requires. It was about 10 months from this awakening to where Nettleton really had any kind of settled conviction that he was in fact born again. But I found it interesting for some reason Nettleton never really enjoyed a strong assurance of salvation. He was of that melancholy, introspective temperament. A man that was used so mightily in the second great awakening and possibly a conservative estimate, according to Dr. Michael Haken, of 25,000 conversions, maybe 30,000, when the population of the entire country was 9 million. And today he's called a forgotten evangelist. So during this awakening, he read Jonathan Edwards' narrative of the revival of religion in Northampton, the diary of David Brainerd. These serve very much to deepen the conviction of his utterly lost condition. So it was about 10 months from the time when Nettleton, his attention was first seriously turned to the subject of religion before he obtained peace and believing. With him, what the Puritans termed the law work was deep and thorough. This lengthy season of conviction gave him a knowledge of the human heart which few possess and which was doubtless intended by God to prepare him for that preeminent success which attended his labor as a minister of Christ. But in uh, the year 1801, his father had passed away and They lived on a large farm, and him being the oldest son of six children, the responsibilities of the farm fell on his shoulders. But all the while, God is working in his heart. He's aspiring to the ministry, specifically the mission field. He had also met Samuel Mills, who we talked about a couple of weeks ago, who was one of the young men from Williams College that was interested in going into the mission field. But providentially, he was hindered because of his finances. He barely was able to get through the school. He didn't want to incur a debt. And so this kept him temporarily from going, but he never left off that ambition until about the year 1822 when he was struck with typhoid so severely that he was sick most of the rest of his life. It had affected him for a full two years. But he did get into Yale, and as I had mentioned a couple of weeks ago, Timothy Dwight, who was the grandson of Jonathan Edwards, was in the president. To give you an idea how bad it was before these revivals came, 
When Dwight took over the presidency of Yale, you had 10 evangelicals out of 110 or 120 students, and the rest of the students were infidels. They were unbelievers, and Dwight had formed a class where he took a number of these aside, and he would answer their questions, and they were starting to be turned around. And this is about the time Nettleton got there, and in the year 18, there was a revival in 1802 and again in 1807. And so Nettleton is there at the time, and the awakening is intense. One of the students was under such deep conviction and fear that he was emaciated upon a bed between life and death. So Asa Hell Nettleton went to get Timothy Dwight to counsel him. Another student went and got one of these infidels who was a scoffer and brought him in to see this student who was so seriously under conviction that it was affecting his health. And this uh, infidel ended up making a profession. Not only so, he had actually himself went into the ministry and had become a missionary for over 20 years. But this is the account. He stood for a moment looking at the emaciated form before him. He listened to the exclamations which told the distress and horror of an awakened conscience and then turning went back to his room to weep there under a sense of his own sin. So that was the unbeliever who was brought in. The other convicted sinner's health rapidly declined under his sufferings. He was confined in a great measure to his bed, and it was feared that with a feeble constitution he must soon sink under the weight of his distress. Well, Dwight got there. Nettleton was in another room praying so fervently for this man who ended up finally relieved of his bondage and fear, granted the spirit of adoption, and was able to have his health restored. But Asa Hell Nettleton had become really sick in school so bad that he had to temporarily leave. At the same time, he's wrestling again with his assurance of salvation. So he goes to the office of the president, Timothy Dwight, lets him know that he has to leave temporarily to recover his own health. Dwight gives him sermons that he had written on the evidences of regeneration and also a treatise on the religious affections by Jonathan Edwards. When Dwight had come into Yale, he had um, met a person there who wasn't even a believer, but Nettleton discovered really early on this guy didn't have a roommate, and he offered to room with him. And eventually he was influential in this person's conversion. But this person said of Asa Hell Nettleton that upon getting this work by Jonathan Edwards, the sermons by Timothy Dwight, the works of Joseph Bellamy, he went into a time of self-examination that he had never seen equaled. So Nettleton was very introspective, but very thorough, making sure the foundation was proper. Well, when it came time for Nettleton to graduate, he still had incurred enough debt that Timothy Dwight gave him work around the college to pay off some of his debt, but he also had the door open to him to where he could go other places to preach. And immediately his preaching was successful. It made an impression on people. He wasn't, he never had the pathos of a George Whitfield. He enunciated every word deliberately. He was very, very careful how he communicated. And surprisingly, I don't think the guy ever wrote any sermon notes. He wrote some things down in his Greek and other languages and so on, but Nettleton almost continually preached extemporaneously. But there began to be fruit from his preaching efforts. And it just seemed like everywhere he went, revival would follow him, the manifest presence of God. It was, it was remarkable that the way that God was using him during this time. 
Well, as he's going through Connecticut, he's seeing what are called the waste places. Some of these churches didn't even have a pastor, but they were called the waste places because of the havoc that had been wrought upon these congregations through the ministry of James Davenport in the First Great Awakening. And Davenport is an enigma because he started out so well. He had such praise from Whitfield and others as one of the most pious men that they had ever witnessed. But here's something that we need to learn from this. Davenport got into an idea that you can know God's will through direct impressions upon the imagination. And he came to this conclusion that he was one that was going to be greatly used of God wherever he went. And his pride had been fed, but so subtly he didn't know it was the devil that was leading him on and he got a following. And they would denounce pastors in a congregation as unconverted. It it was really bad, and it went on for a long time before six pastors finally were able to sit Davenport down and settle him down and convict him that he was not being led on by the Holy Spirit. He was being led on by the subtlety of the devil. Now, Davenport had retracted his errors. He saw the damage that he had caused. He went to the places where he had done this damage, but it was too late. Because when you work up people into this kind of frenzy, and they think that you're greatly used of God, and then you come back and you try to make it right, some of the people think that, well, you've just, now you're listening to the voice of the enemy, And he was never able to repair the damage. And Nettleton saw this as he was going through Connecticut. And it made him a student of what is fanaticism and what is sympathy in revivals and the things that it can, the damage it can cause. Now, Nettleton learned a lot about this in his efforts. A couple of things up front, which I think may have been wrong in the ministry of Whitfield, and that is these itinerant evangelists were going from place to place. They weren't spending a lot of time in any one place. So uh, Whitfield never really made himself available to counsel the awakened. Nettleton, on the other hand, would stay three or four months in a place, He would never stay where he didn't think he was welcome. And he always made it a point when he was in a place for any continued length of time that the people's appreciation for their own pastor was going to be increased. It wasn't going to be diminished. He never eroded a ministry that was already in place. He wouldn't have been... One of the problems that happened in the first great awakening was some of the brashness. For example, Gilbert Tennant in a sermon called The Danger of an Unconverted Ministry. And rightly so, he aimed at that there were unconverted Presbyterian pastors, but the censoriousness was too strong and people lost respect for their pastors And so these churches became waste places. And Nettleton had learned from that, and he wasn't going to repeat it. But maybe some of you really haven't studied what happens in a revival. And I think it's important that I read a couple of paragraphs, because a lot of this isn't going to make sense unless you realize how you counsel people who are under this intense of an awakening and how you counsel a person in a day of small things is going to be different because of the excitability, because of sympathy. Sympathy is simply what we have even in common with the animals. That's how we relate. If I yawn, you see me yawn, it causes you to yawn. But if you're in a congregation, 
and somebody cries out in distress, do you leave him there? Do you leave him in the congregation? Or is, would it be better maybe to take him out and bring him to a separate room to counsel him? So I'm going to read this, and then I'm going to ask a question at the end. This is from a book called Authentic Records of Revival, Now in Progress in the United Kingdom, 1859. This is Boviva, Ireland. It was thus evident the Lord was in the midst of us answering the earnest and fervent prayers for his Holy Spirit offered in the name of Christ. The following day, June 12th, was the Sabbath, a day which will never be forgotten by many in this parish. Oh, with what power and majesty Jehovah walked amongst us. When the usual time for public worship came, the church was so crowded that we were obliged to retire to the churchyard and conduct services in the open air. The crowd became immense. The minister and congregation of Scriggan have been joined us, and a more solemn assembly never met on earth. That was what marked Asahel Nettleton's revivals. He said in one place that in an inquiry room, which sometimes could be a house or some large separate building, 200 people from the congregation crying out, moaning together that he said, I've never felt anything so close to eternity. The passions were so agitated and the emotions were so strong, you could feel the place shake under your feet. So he says, during the services, the tears and suppressed sobs of many showed that it was no ordinary occasion, that it was a day of God's power, that the spirit of power was dealing personally with men's souls. When the benediction was pronounced, a few retired, but the great majority lingered, stood in fact as if held in a vice or bound with a chain, and in a moment as if struck with a thunderbolt. About a hundred persons were prostrated on their knees, sending forth a wail from hearts bruised, broken, and overwhelmed with horror. I'm going to qualify this and tell you something that I told the folk in Holland when I taught this there. I cannot find in all my studies of revival and other works that God has limited himself either to show a Christian manifesting joys, and hopes of heaven. He hasn't limited himself, neither does he limit himself sometimes to the body that is not reconciled to Christ and what they may feel of their condition if they're not reconciled to him. Oh, what must the wellings of the lost in hell be, he says, when the discovery is made that then lamps are gone out, that the day of mercy is past and the door of hope is shut forever. For hours these stricken, smitten, bleeding souls remained on their bended knees, unconscious of everything but their own guilt and danger and need of a Savior, pleading and praying with an intensity and fervor which surpasses all description. The evening of Wednesday, June 15th, was appointed for prayer, and long before the hour for commencing the service, the church was crowded. The awful sadness in every countenance bespoke the deep earnestness within. Even the most ungodly were overawed and wore a solemn sadness on their faces. Had a pestilence swept over the neighborhood, leaving one dead in every house, greater awe would not have been produced. At the close of the services, several efforts were made to dismiss the congregation, but without avail. And it was not until 4 o'clock in the morning that the people could be persuaded to go home. Multitudes were again on that night steeped in awful sorrow and stung with the most poignant remorse for sin. Such an utterable horror overwhelmed one young man that blood streamed from his mouth and his nose. Another man who all his life was a profligate had such a vivid view of the horrors of hell. And the pains of hell took such hold of him that he cried like a demoniac that a hundred devils were dragging him to the bottomless pit. So here's the question. You're leading this congregation. You see that kind of intense fear. What do you do? 
I can tell you that the temptation is to speak comfort too quickly. And these are the things that Nettleton avoided. And as we'll see later on, Charles Finney exacerbated. He worked on these emotional things. So how did Nettleton handle these situations? He improved greatly as a preacher. Heman Humphrey wrote, The chief excellence of his preaching seemed to consist in great plainness and simplicity and discrimination, and much solemnity and affectionate earnestness of manner in the application of the truth to the heart and conscience. And taking away the excuses of sinners and leaving them without help and hope except in the sovereign mercy of God. Nettleton is noted for his use of meetings of inquiry, inquiry meetings. That's to be distinguished from the ancients bench. Because an inquiry meeting, inquiry meeting was a separate building, maybe a house, where Nettleton learned to counsel these people one by one in a low tone of voice so that the person next to them couldn't even hear what was being said. It was not prolonged. It was not protracted because he said too much communication often left the sinners confused. But he also noticed that if any people were depending too much upon him and supposing that he could do anything, To alleviate their guilt, sometimes he would mysteriously leave. He knew that God must save in God alone, and he was only going to point them to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Asa Hell Nettleton couldn't save anybody. After a short address suited to produce solemnity and to make all who were present feel that they were in the presence of a holy and heart-searching God, he would offer prayer. Then he would speak to each individual present in a low voice unless the number was so large as to render it impossible. When that was the case, he would sometimes have one or two brethren in the ministry to assist him. He would converse with each one but a short time. The particular object of this conversation is to ascertain the state of each one's mind. He could quickly, by talking to them, see what counsel was necessary. That would really take some discernment. But you need to distinguish that from what Davenport was doing. Davenport, in the first Great Awakening, was under the delusion that he could tell if you were converted or not merely by the way that you communicated your testimony. Nettleton wouldn't go there. He wouldn't pronounce hope too soon, but neither would he suppose that he could judge a person's heart. He was so far from relying on mere sympathy and religious awakening that he seemed rather to be afraid of it. And he once separated two bosom friends who had taken their room together under convictions lest they should too much operate upon each other. So we talked about sympathy. If I was to take a rock and toss it into a pond of water, you would see the ripples go out to the ends of the pond. And sometimes that would happen in sympathy. One person who could be in the front was under tremendous conviction of sin. Other people would be agitated not because of what was communicated in the sermon, but merely by the effect of sympathy. And it could go through a crowd. And Archibald Alexander tells a story in Thoughts on Religious Experience that he had attended a revival in the early 1800s. Archibald Alexander, before he became the first teacher at Princeton Theological Seminary in 1812, was a pastor for 20 years. So these revivals were going on, and he wanted to witness them. And he went to this place where this pastor was preaching with a great deal of pathos and power. And he noticed that the effect of sympathy was going through this entire congregation, and you had some farmers who were off into a separate fixture where Alexander was convinced that they couldn't even hear the sermon. But so powerful was the effect of sympathy that he said it was like a wind that just affected these people, and they couldn't hardly stand against it, even though it was mere human emotion. It wasn't because they had heard the word and were convicted by that. So what Nettleton would do, 
typically if somebody cried out in a congregation, was to take them out and get them into a separate room and have somebody that he trusted counsel them. He didn't allow these things to go on. And I think early in his ministry, that's a mistake that Jonathan Edwards made. Because he said, you know, these things are going to happen. And he says, I wonder if those people that are my critics Critics would behave themselves more favorably if they were under this strong conviction of the Spirit. Well, we grant him the point, but Edwards didn't check some of the outcries that were going on in the congregation. Less so probably Whitfield, because Whitfield has such power. I mean, when David Garrick said that he could reduce an audience to tears merely by the way he uttered the word Mesopotamia, that is also going to work upon the emotional feelings. And because Whitfield didn't stick around a lot of times to counsel people that supposedly were under this conviction, Nettleton wasn't going to make that mistake. So there were things that happened in the first great awakening that Edwards himself, I believe, really corrected. And you can see it in his work that was written later after a narrative of surprising conversions called Thoughts on the Present Revival of Religion, and more particularly his treatise on the religious affections, which almost to a fault he corrects it because some of the things in the positive signs that Edwards lays out are so subjective that the average person would have difficult to apply them. For example, when he says that true religious affections have beautiful symmetry and proportion, well, a lot of people that are introspective and so on can't properly analyze how their affections are toward God. But my point is, Edwards really learned from some of the early mistakes and he wrote about it in his later writings are so helpful. There's things in a narr- I mean, in uh, Thoughts on the Present Revival of Religion that I think are unequaled in experimental theology on the whole subject of revival and so much of the things he's correcting. I believe he doesn't name Davenport, but he has that kind of a thing in mind. Impressions on the imagination where a person is under the delusion that God is revealing to him things that can come to pass soon with or without texts of Scripture, where the Scripture was not meant for that purpose. People run with it and so on. Edwards' section on undiscerned spiritual pride is probably unequaled in the human language, except maybe Richard Baxter and the Reformed pastor. Edwards had learned so much. There's so much wisdom in that work. And that's why Nettleton was such a student of his. Nettleton never countenanced the early admission of young converts to church membership, but thought much of training them and watching over them for a season as candidates for this privilege. Nettleton never interfered with, but always encouraged and strengthened the relations of the regular pastors of the churches to their members. He never approved the special efforts to produce a religious excitement. On the contrary, he aimed only to follow where the Lord led the way, enjoining, of course, the discharge of duty at all times. So jealous was he in this respect that he would not visit a place where he feared they were relying upon him. But in about the year 1821, Charles Finney starts laboring in upstate New York. Nettleton makes friends with Lyman Beecher, and they're both concerned about what we call the new measures. Protracted meetings meant that the meeting where Finney was preaching, it would go on all night, not because it was an effect of something, but to affect something. We noticed in this revival in Boviva, Ireland, that they stayed there all night because they're so affected. But the reason that Finney did it was because he was working upon the will through a strong powerful, mere passion and human emotion to try to get these people to make decisions. So Finney would use the anxious bench. 
And so Lyman Beecher and Nettleton were writing back and forth in a number of letters. Lyman Beecher wrote something called Letters on the New Measures. But one thing that's been interesting about this study is what happened to Lyman Beecher. Ironically, more of you know about his family than you think because his daughter is Harriet Beecher Stowe who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. And this is Henry Ward Beecher who became one of the greatest preachers of the 19th century. But unfortunately, by that time, They were preaching against causes. They weren't preaching really sound doctrine. Beecher went on to imbibe the teachings of Nathaniel Taylor, who was a successor to Dwight. And I I have to press something home here that I think is so important that I learned from this, and that is the importance of really adhering to a confession of faith. Because what led to Beecher's error, Taylor's error, finally the disruption of the Presbyterian Church in 1837, it really came down to one doctrine. And it wasn't limited atonement. Atonement, it was the imputation of Adam's sin to his posterity. They stopped believing in the total depravity and the total inability of man. And Finney later on, he bought this stuff wholesale. Nettleton first heard of Finney when he was preaching on Long Island, New York, at a place known as Jamaica. While here, he began to receive reports about certain revivals and strange happenings in the vicinity of Oneida County, New York. An uproar was taking place there because of the introduction of what were being referred to as the new measures. The manifestations of these phenomena were a denunciatory style of preaching, irreverent attitudes in the pulpit, bringing women forward to preach and exhort in mixed assemblies, calling people by name from the pulpit. He would actually interview the pastor before he would do this meeting and find out, is there anybody here who may be in a state of declension or whatever? And in his preaching, he would call them out from the pulpit in front of everybody and tell them to get right with God. It was censorious, it was imprudent, and it was uncharitable. (laughs) <laughs> so he would use these high-pressure methods of getting converts, such as urging people to rise up in their seats or come down to the altar in order to become Christians. Although he was at first reluctant to get involved, Nettleton, his friends persuaded him that the new measures which had caused the followers of Finney to be zealously devoted to him. In other words, people were saying, well, Nettleton's in agreement with us. Finney would actually say, Nettleton's on my side. And the reason Nettleton really didn't want to get involved, by 1822, he was pretty sick because of the typhoid that hit him. His health had really declined. If you look at his entire life, there's only about 11 years of really fruitful ministry. And then he struggled to the end to his death in 1844 because of the sickness. But he, so many people said to him, if you don't come and help us, with the things that are going on here, that this is going to get out of hand. And he had actually met with Finney on a couple of occasions, but Finney was incorrigible, untractable, unteachable, proud. And the reason is because, like in the case of Davenport, people were feeding his ego. and said, don't listen to him. Look at the good that you're doing. So he became more and more unteachable. Nettleton said, I've been long wishing to correct some of the peculiarities that I might invite him into my own field and introduce him to my friends. But aside from my feeble health, one consideration only has prevented me from making the attempt. Some of his particular friends are urging him on to the very thing which I wish him to drop. I fear that their flattering representations will overrule all that I can say, and having dropped these peculiarities as labor for a while might be less successful, and then he would resort again to the same experiment. So he wrote a lengthy letter to a pastor that was associated with Finney, a pastor, Aiken. And I want to speak about something on the side that was going on at the same time, and that was the attention that was being given in those days to false conversions. And I've shown some of you this book here, <clears throat> 
I discovered this book. This is the first edition because it's footnoted in Joseph Tracy's Great Awakening, which I think was 1840. I looked for 30-some years for this book because the title was so amazing to me. 1828, Andover Theological Seminary. Essay upon the influence of the imagination on the nervous system contributing to a false hope in religion, Grant Powers. So um, when I taught this in Holland, uh, Thomas Fermato overheard that I had been looking for this book, and I still had never seen it. So they had discovered uh, where they could get a, a PDF made for me the first time I ever laid eyes on it. And I was so glad to see that. And then just two months ago, I finally was able to get my own copy. But if I could recommend anything about the emotions in revival, it would be in volume three of Robert Dabney's discussions called Spurious Religious Excitements. Dabney became a professor of moral philosophy and he, just, just a paragraph from this work, it's so profound. He talks about the proper use of sympathy. Because people would be saying, well, we're just going to impress the intellect. We're going to give them truth. And we're going, going to try to avoid working upon the feelings. And Dabney said, that's not even possible. That's not how we're constructed. There's no perfect impression on the cognition without affecting the human feelings. What you have to determine is what are the correct emotions and what are spurious. So he says, the whole use then of sympathetic excitement is to catch the attention and warm it. So a pastor preaches with pathos and the people are moved. That's not wrong. That's storing up the ground, the soil, but it's not an end in itself until the seed of the truth is planted. It's not going to bear fruit. He says, but it is the truth thus lodged in the attention that must do the whole work of sanctification. Here is the all-important discrimination. Attention, sympathetic warmths are merely a preparation for casting in the seed of the word. The preacher who satisfies himself with exciting the sympathies and neglects to throw in at once the vital truth is like the husbandman who digs and rakes the soil and then expects to crop though he's planted no seed. Well, it's not that they weren't planting any seed, and this wasn't written to Finney. It does make a difference what seed you're planting in the ground as well. And I think these people saw that Arminianism and the denial of the depravity of the human heart is mixed seed. The only result is a more rampant growth of weeds, he says. How often do we see this mistake committed? The preacher either displays in his own person a high-wrought religious emotion or stirs the natural sensibilities by painting in exciting and pictorial words and gestures. Some natural feeling connected by its occasion with a religious topic as a touching death or other bereavement, or he stimulates the selfish fears by painting the agonies of a lost soul or the selfish desires and hopes by a sensuous description of the pleasures of heaven. Then if sympathetic feeling is awakened or the carnal passions of hope, fear, and desire are moved, he acts as though his work were done. He permits and encourages the hearers to flatter themselves that they are religious because they are feeling something about religion. I repeat, if the stimulation of carnal and sympathetic feeling is not at once and widely used, and used solely as a secondary means of fixing a warm attention on didactic truth, that's teaching, which is the sole instrument of conversion and sanctification, and the preacher has mischiefly abused the souls of his hearers. The first and most obvious mischief is the encouragement of a fatal fatal deception and self-flattery. Unrenewed men are tacitly invited to regard themselves as either born again or at least in the most encouraging progress towards that blessing, while in fact they have not felt a single feeling or principle which may not be the mere natural product of a dead heart. This delusion has slain its thousands. If you read read that whole thing, you would marvel at what Dabney wrote before we had anything like the charismatic movement that we have in our day. 
I've been personally derided for bringing these things up, not to anybody in our congregation, of course, but because I'm talking about the desire to impress the emotions and the sympathy and the feelings and work them up in a worship service. And the emphasis isn't on the word. And people think, I'm an old fuddy-duddy. You just, you don't understand. And a lot of these people start to embrace the charismatic gifts because they want the feeling. And that becomes the end in itself. And that was the problem with Finney, is the priority was there to work upon the feelings. Finney immediately jumped to his own conclusions and his own defense. So he hears what Nettleton is saying about him in his letter to Aiken, and he preaches a sermon in the church of a minister, Nathan Beeman, from Amos 3.3, how can two walk together except they be agreed? So instead of saying, well, I grant his point, maybe we have been doing some things wrong here, he digs deeper. In this sermon, he heaps scorn on his opponents. He accuses them of having dead and frosty hearts and of not being right with God, thus accounting for their opposition to the new revivalism. Lyman Beecher, in his desire to keep the revival camp intact without a war breaking up between the Western and Eastern revivalists, called for a meeting at New Lebanon. New Lebanon, New York, the year is 1827, and you can mark it in a way that that meeting in New Lebanon, New York, is the turning point from the old evangelicalism to the new modern followers of the altar call, the Finneyites, and so on. It's an interesting thing because Nettleton is called the forgotten evangelist. Finney, to this day, is extolled as the great preacher of the Second Great Awakening. John Thornberry says in his book, God Sent Revival, that when he wrote that work, he went to a theological school that was founded by Nettleton because he knew, well, they wanted to do research, but he knew that there was a portrait there at one time of Nettleton. He couldn't find it. It was in an adjoining room up in the attic, leaning against a beam in the attic. He found it. Now, I guess it's in its proper place. On the other hand, I'm told you can go to Wheaton College, and there's this prominent picture of Charles Finney on the wall. And I I don't know that I can account for how did this happen with all these revivals that had taken place and so on, that Nettleton had so many people converted under his ministry and his name is forgotten. And in our day... And you can, you can check the statistics on this because I was looking on Amazon. There are more materials by Finney 10 to 1 than anything on Nettleton. So the meeting in New Lebanon, New York did not have the desire. And some people think that part of the problem was Nettleton focused on the new measures instead of the doctrines of Finney that were wreaking havoc. I don't know if Nettleton knew so much about Finney's doctrine because he was a Presbyterian pastor. But I think the second thing is Nettleton really, by that time, was pretty sick. And he didn't want a long, drawn-out battle with Finney. But it just kept getting worse. Nettleton, by 1844, had passed away. And Finney keeps on going. And you see it in our day. There's so much need of instruction on these things. In 1839, Hampton, Sydney College, Virginia, and Jefferson College, Pennsylvania awarded Nettleton an honorary doctorate degree. He reluctantly received these after considering all the attention he would draw if he refused. But he he had never married, probably at the time he had thought that he was going into the mission field, and he was focused on that. But Nettleton... A couple of things about him. 
he was never, ever caught alone with a, a lady. W- wouldn't walk with her or anything. Another thing is, and this may be a fault, he was scrupulous to avoid receiving any kind of a monetary thanksgiving for the labors that he did. As long as he had the food and his raiment, he was content. But that may have been to a fault. And from what I understand, and I can speak from personal experience, um, a lot of times being single like that does make you somewhat socially boorish. He did have his idiosyncrasies. But as far as being able to counsel people during revivals, he probably didn't have an equal. But he's forgotten in our day. But I still, I have to leave this with you because there's so much to this story that's related. It's to the side of this, and that is what was happening to our colleges and seminaries and so on. And it is amazing to me because I studied this out in some detail about 25 years ago. I was able to get a number of copies of what's called the Quarterly Christian Spectator, which came out of New Haven, which was really Yale. There were 16 charges, for example, that were brought up against Albert Barnes, and he had the Sermon the Way of Salvation, his commentary on Romans, and so on. Both Barnes and Beecher were brought up in trial for heresy and were acquitted. Now, heresy is used was used a little... Loosely compared to what we would do in our day, if, you know. But what it really came down to, it wasn't the 16 things that were the problem to me. Everything that I could study about this, it was one thing, and that was the imputation of Adam's sin to his posterity. And it even started with Timothy Dwight. What was interesting to me, the one thing Nettleton disagreed with his college president on was the effects upon the fall of the fall upon the human heart. Dwight had already drifted from that little, a little. Though in 1817, Dwight was really concerned about the direction that Nathaniel Taylor was going. And it just continued until it split the Presbyterian Church in the year 1837. The Presbyterian Church came together again as the United Presbyterian Church in 1865, but that's usually at the expense of doctrine. By 1865, the United Presbyterian Church was starting to embrace a lot of liberalism and so on. But, brethren, we we have it good here. I started in the Reformed Baptist Movement in the year 1984. In these years, I've been through classes on the confession six times, three by Pastor Nichols, three by Sam Waldron, and it never gets old. But you have people that leave here, and they don't care. They don't prize what God has given us, these good men that have given us these confessions and labored so diligently and so on. Now, I'm going to give anybody an opportunity to give me a comment before I close. Does anybody have something they need to say? Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, let me tell you another story about that that's really interesting. You know how much uh, fuss that we make about the sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God by Jonathan Edwards, right? There's only two sources that we know about that records what happened when Jonathan Edwards on July 8, 1741, preached in Enfield, Connecticut. What was communicated by Eliezer Willock to Benjamin Trumbull in a book called A History of Connecticut. The only other source, and a couple of months ago I was trying to find, 
this diary, and I found it in a library of a town of 15,600 people in Massachusetts. And the man's name was Stephen Williams, a diary. And what I was trying to find is how far Jonathan Edwards got into that sermon before there was such an outcry in the congregation that he couldn't finish. Remember, he held his hands up to be heard. What is missing in that whole account is what Eliezer Wheelock said, that the people in the surrounding towns were afraid that the Spirit of God was going to pass them by. And they wanted God's manifest presence there in Enfield, Connecticut. So it just says, the neighboring people, three words, spent the entire night, the night before, prostrated on the ground before God in prayer, saying, God, please visit this congregation. The way we've rewritten that history is we look at the words of Jonathan Edwards in a sermon, Deuteronomy 32, verse 35, and we say, well, that's what created the revival, and we totally forget that God uses means, and it was the people of Enfield, Connecticut, on their faces before God, the night before that God Oh, and he heard the cries of his people, and he came down to the residence in Enfield. So to answer your question, prayer is a means to revival. God is sovereign, and revival is a sovereign act of God. But he does stir up his people. He gives them a spirit of grace and supplication. And that's a part of that story. And this story that really needs to be emphasized is that these people were praying for Revival. Nettleton reminds me a lot of Robert Murray McShane. He spent so much time in prayer and personal godliness that it was said of Robert Murray McShane that when he stood up into a pulpit sometimes before he even said a word, people would start weeping because it was so obvious that this guy had come out of the presence of God. There was just something about his demeanor. And that's what happened in Nettleton as well. Nettleton would have no power at all if the Holy Spirit hadn't been coming to these congregations. So I hope that answers your question. Pastor Nichols, do you have anything to add to this? Okay. All right, I'm going to I'll pray, and you can be dismissed. Thanks for your attention. Father, how could we not desire this? How could we not desire that you would come and meet with your people? The church needs it. The community that we live in needs this, and our nation needs this. We would love and long to see your spirit go forth in these congregations where it is said that in five years, 150 churches in New England could record that revival had come to their congregations. You've done it before, Lord. We're asking, we're begging, please. Visit us again and start even this morning in your worship service that your name would be hallowed and that your name would be held up in this congregation. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.